My name is Jeffrey Baum, and I'm the Managing Director of the Center on Communication Leadership and Policy at the Annenberg School. And this uh, series is made, done in partnership with the Bedrosian Center at the Price School of Public Policy, and I know Aubrey is here from the uh, Bedrosian Center, and also the Unruh Institute of Politics at the, uh, uh, at the Dornsife College and the Department of Political Science. And Kirsten Olson and Roz and Twee are here from the uh, Unruh Institute. We're, we're grateful for that partnership to bring this weekly conversation together. We have an amazing program uh, to talk about. As you, many of us were up late last night watching the results at Super Tuesday and, and the, the interaction between the media and, and, the, uh, uh, and the candidates has been unprecedented and then the, the things that the media has chosen to focus on has been fascinating as well. And at the same time the president is talking about uh, a possible military action in Iran, uh, much of the news coverage was about uh, what a, a radio talk show host said or uh, on, his, uh, on his show. And so what is defining the agenda for conversation that then is uh, becoming the focus of attention. And so we have a program that uh, is going to be moderated by one of our senior fellows, Morley Winograd. I'll tell you a little bit more about Morley later. But we're very grateful to have joining us Tom Doten, the editor at large of Neon Tommy, who's a graduate journalism student at USC and part of our News 21 program and has been writing about the, uh, the campaign. And I'll show you the Neon Tommy coverage of uh, politics up on the website. And then we have Adam Nagurney, the uh, West Coast Bureau Chief and former Chief National Political Correspondent for the New York Times. Adam's been with the New York Times a long time, but I knew him first when he was at uh, USA Today covering politics, and I used to be at C-SPAN. And Adam's uh, always looked to as somebody who has great insight as to what's happening in politics today. And then also, uh, to round out the panel, we have Cindy Kennard, our senior fellow for the Center on Communication Leadership and Policy. But Cindy is also one of the most respected journalists and journalism executives in the business. She was head of NPR West for many years and is a former uh, national correspondent and bureau chief for CBS News and covered uh, George W. Bush back in his days when she was based in Austin and was a, a colleague of people like Molly Ivins and, and others uh, from her time in Texas and still uh, uh, swaps emails with Carl Rove all the time. She's uh, a... Yeah, too. But uh, to, st to start the program, we have uh, Morley Winograd, our senior fellow at our center. Morley was uh, formerly head of the uh, Center on uh, Communication Technology Management out of the business school, but Morley also spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C., and he was the architect of the Clinton administration's re reinventing government initiative. He's a White House policy advisor and, um, and an advisor to uh, former Vice President Al Gore. But since he's left the policymaking world, Morley has, has really become one of the most thoughtful uh, an analysis analysts of, of generational change in the, the forces that are shaping our civic dialogue. And Morley's going to start the program setting up uh, some issues that he's been observing during this campaign and, uh, and how our civic ethos is evolving. And then we'll get into uh, some of the uh, other developments that, have, that we've been able to witness. But uh, I'll let Morley start off, and please welcome, what a great panel, and uh, we'll get the conversation going. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Six months ago to the day, actually, uh, the Center for Communication Leadership and Policy was kind enough to ask me and my co-author, Mike Hayes, to talk about this new book we had just published called Millennial Momentum, which in, among other topics, talked about the impact the millennial generation, all of you for the most part, uh, will uh, we'll have on American society and American life. And in that book, um, we suggested, next slide, that um, uh, about every 80 years, because of the pace and timing of generational change, this country has gone through a heart-rendering, very divisive debate over what we call its civic ethos. Others would say the size and purpose of government, what role government should play, how big or how small in the lives of individual Americans and in our American democracy. And what we said then was, and certainly in the tenor of those times and I think still of today, is that each of these times in American history, be it the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, or the New Deal, the debate over America's civic ethos has provoked a great deal of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which we have one wonderful slide on, uh, on the part of the uh, electorate. 
as to just what course and way forward the country should take. And as a result, you, we predicted that this particular campaign, and today we're going to talk about both the, cam the campaign, both from a candidate perspective and a media perspective, and to Jeff's point, some of the unique attributes of the campaign. In each of these cases, historically, this is the time period when the country is most worried about the future. And as a result, candidates for political office, be it the, the historic uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates or the famous Commonwealth speech, Commonwealth Club speech of FDR, have had an opportunity to tell the American public what it is that they see as the answer to the question uh, that, this, that the search for a new civic ethos poses, namely, what should the role and scope of government be going forward? Now, I've just got three slides before we call on the panel, because we're going to give the panel about a half hour to talk about all this and different questions, and then we'll have time for all of you to speak, that tries to summarize what has happened so far, and of course, to some degree, that's been focused in the, in the Republican side. I've got a couple of slides summing up what the two leading candidates in the GOP have said, and then I think we found a video of President Obama addressing the same subject. So this slide is Mitt Romney. Obama's fundamental error is that he believes government creates jobs and opportunity. He's wrong. He puts his faith in government. I put my faith in people. And then each of the candidates has recognized that this is an historic moment in history. So Romney says this is a pivotal moment in history of the country. We either be led by men and women who care only for the present, who promise more and ask for less, and who ignore the tightening noose of debt or we will be led by those who believe that deficits matter and who have the courage to act with fiscal responsibility. We are only inches away from no longer being a free economy. This election could be our last chance. Lots of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and also a very clear statement of one way of thinking about the country's civic ethos. His main opponent, and still true after last night, is, says the following. My vision for America is to restore America's greatness through the promotion of faith, family, and freedom. We're a land of opportunity where all Americans have the chance to rise on their own merits and hard work. I believe in equality of opportunity and that American entrepreneurs and business owners create jobs that skilled and committed workers can have to sustain them, not government. And once again, the historic moment phrased by uh, Santorum is we are reaching a tipping point when those who pay are the minority and those who receive are the majority. We need a renewed focus on creating opportunity, not dividing Americans by class, on creating wealth, not redistributing it, and on promoting savings rather than dependency. This decision will be starker than at any time since the election of 1860. So he also noticed that we were in a period of FUD that has occurred in the past. So those, uh, we couldn't find the perfect videos for you on those two candidates, but I think it makes clear that they have at the heart of their campaign an uh, urgent desire to convince Americans that the choice of which path we follow in the future is an historic and ultimately deciding one about the nature of American democracy. We did have a slide, and I think we have it there on President Obama's statement around some of this in which government plays a larger, more partnership role. But we found a very emotional clip of the president talking about American values and the future of America that we thought we ought to use as the lead into our panel discussion. Let me tell you, I, I, I keep on hearing these same folks talk about values all the time. You want to talk about values? Hard work, that's a value. Looking out for one another, that's a value. The idea that we're all in it together and I'm my brother's keeper and sister's keeper, that's a value. They're out there, they're out there talking about you like you're some special interest that needs to be beaten down. Since when are hard-working men and women 
who, 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 are, who are putting in a hard day's work every day, since when are they special interests? Since, since when is the idea that we, we look out for one another a bad thing? You know, I, I remember my old, old Fred Tenkett, and he, he used to say, what is it about working men and women they find so offensive? You know, this notion that we, sh we should have let the auto industry die, that we, we should pursue anti-worker policies in the hopes that, that unions like yours will, will buckle and unravel, that's part of that same old you-are-on-your-own philosophy that says we should just le leave everybody to fend for themselves. Let, let, let the, the most powerful uh, do whatever they please. They think the best way to boost the economy is to roll back the reforms we put into place to, to prevent another crisis, to let Wall Street write the rules again. Mm -hmm. They think the best way to help families afford health care is to roll back the reforms we passed that's already lowering costs for millions of Americans. Yeah. They want to go back to the days when insurance companies could deny, deny your coverage or, or jack up your rates whenever and however they pleased. Yeah. They think we should keep cutting taxes for tho those at the very top. For people like me, they, even though we don't need it, just so they can keep paying lower tax rates than their secretaries. Well, uh, let, let me tell you something. Not, 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 not to put too fine a point on it, they're wrong. <laughs> they are wrong. Okay, so the campaign seems to have headed down the path we said it was going to head down six months ago, a fundamental and bitter conversation about the nature of America's civic ethos. What we're going to do today is ask our panelists to comment on some specific questions about the campaign. And we're going to start with the candidate campaigns, and mostly we've obviously seen the four Republican candidates. For the Ron Paul enthusiasts in the audience, uh, we could easily have put up an even starker statement of the libertarian civic ethos that he is so uh, much in favor of. Um, but let's start with our senior uh, uh, journalist here, uh, Adam. Would you say that compared to other recent presidential campaigns, that the GOP primary has produced more or less clarity about the differences between the contenders on this fundamental issue of the role in government? Um, hi, first of all, thanks for coming being here. Um, I would say in this case, bet between the contenders, I'm going to leave out Paul and Gingrich, and sorry if anyone disagrees, because I just want to talk about the two guys who have a remote chance in the nomination. Um, I don't think so much, and that has to do with Romney. I think that what we've seen here is a lot of, I mean, it's become obvious at this point, repositioning of, of Romney by Romney. And the Romney we're seeing running for president now seems to have a different view of the role of government, which I know we're going to get into, than the Romney who was governor of Massachusetts, I mean, it wasn't that many years ago. So I think that a lot of what his campaign has been about is sort of to change his positions and to blur positions a bit. So I'm not sure we're seeing that much of a distinction between Santorum and Romney on what the role of government is. By contrast, to your other point, you know, I mean, every campaign I've covered, going back to 1860, um, <laughs> um, that's a joke. Um, you, you always have these candidates coming out and saying, this is the most important his election in history. You know, you know, Clinton said it, Obama said it, I think Bush 41 said it, I don't, Bush 43 said it, I don't think Bush 41, 41 said it. Bush 41 said it. But no, I do think these guys have dramatically different views of the role of government. And perhaps Santorum believes it more than Romney. I don't know, Romney seems to believe it now. And I think you saw it very well in the, in the clip we just saw with Obama. The, the, and um, in that case, there is a choice here in terms of what government should do, what obligations of government is or is not. And I think that in a general election, there's going to be a real difference on that. Now, there was also in um, the last election, just that McCain was kind of an odd duck, and that kind of got messed up a bit. So. Thank you. And Tom, um, just judging from your age, you're probably relatively new to presidential primary campaigns, uh, not as a journalist, but just as a uh, voter and a student and a careful observer. Has this campaign so far left you more or less enlightened about the choices you're now going to get to make in the June California primary, or the general election for that matter, since you may decide not to vote in the primary? I don't want to get you uh, locked into a particular political preference. Well, given uh, 
given how long this primary seems to be running, it looks like California is actually going to matter anyway. So I guess from that from that perspective, I, uh, you know, it does make a big difference. But um, I think what's what's been interesting so far about the primary is how many different front runners there have been. Well, Mitt Romney's remained at that, you know, twenty eight something percent. Um, the there, there's been this carousel of different people that have come up. You've had, you know, starting off with the Michelle Bachman to uh, Rick Perry to a Herman Cain to you know Rick Santorum, Newt Gingrich uh, before Rick Santorum, and so. There's been a lot of opportunities for any one of these candidates to be put in the spotlight, and you get to see what it is that they're popular for, and also ultimately what was their downfall, uh, and what made them sort of a toxic candidate to anybody that wanted to win the election, any Republican that wanted to win the election. So uh, from that perspective, I think there's been a lot of clarity in terms of what media persona these people are going to have. Um, in terms of the differences between their views on government, I think it's you know coming down within Rick Santorum and Mitt Romney, basically as Rick Santorum as the candidate who stands for conservative values that they don't conservatives are, are not yet comfortable with in Mitt Romney, and uh, you know I don't know how much excitement there is for young people uh, for either of these candidates. I know that Mitt Romney has a serious problem if you look at the exit polls with young people. Uh, he does very well with the 65 and older, and with the uh, and with the more wealthy voters. Which you know, I am not so lucky to be a young person and also qualify as a wealthy voter. <laughs> but um, you know, it's 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 going to be difficult for a, either of these candidates to really make a strong case that they are the the right choice for a young generation. But they've all had a chance to make their case public. Uh, just on that subject, briefly, one new data point from uh, today. Circle, which is an organization that studies youth participation in elections and has so over the last decade. It's currently located at Tufts University. Um, but despite that, it does nice work. Um, the, uh, 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 they just released their uh, summary of the participation of uh, the millennial generation, those between 18 and 30, in Super Tuesday. And it was not a super day for generational participation, at least in terms of GOP attracting uh, young people's vote. Only 5% of the votes cast yesterday were cast by people under 30, even though people under 30 in this year will represent 24% of the overall eligible electorate. So that uh, sort of is reflective of the point Tom was making in the ability of the current crop of Republican candidates to attract young voters. So uh, then just to get Cindy involved here, uh, you heard some of you know uh, the extensive um, history as a journalist that Cindy brings to this conversation, uh, broadcast television at local, national, international levels, correspondent for CBS News, et cetera. But now, Cindy, you get to watch this one from a more objective, supposedly at least academic perspective. Has that allowed you to notice things about the campaign and the candidate's message that struck you as, strikes you as different from that which you observed in your days as a journalist? You know, we always had a, um, and I'm sure Adam did in his newsroom, this enormous discussion right around election time of how much we need to cover the horse race and how much we need to cover the issues. And I know Adam's the same kind of journalist I was and I like to think I am at times when I'm still doing some writing. <laughs> that you know, our obligation as journalists should be to cover the issues. But somehow, some way, none of this is coming through in the last six months to a year. Um, I, would, I would argue strongly that the reason this is is there's never been more money in this system, at least in my lifetime. Everybody knows well about the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court. I'll tell you, in the 2010 election, and I did a lot of writing about this for a recent appointment I had to the Federal Communications Commission. $4.5 billion was spent in the 2010 election on political media. And when you look at that and you sort of parse it all down, $2 billion went to broadcast television in this country. So all these local primaries that are happening in state by state, where all these ads, all that money's being spent, on all those advocacy ads, all those PAC ads, which I think we'll talk about, I'm sure, more and more in this conversation today. 
Um, it, it's unprecedented. I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime. So that's muddying all of the debate, and, and it's muddying all of the message, and it's hard to even know what planet you're on because of that, by the way. And I think it's hard for the reporters, and I'm not making excuses for the journalists, but I'm certainly frustrated by the fact that that Rush Limbaugh story went on for five days. I mean, enough is enough uh, with that. Um, you know, we have that happening on the other side as well. There's certainly been enough times where um, TV hosts that may be considered on the left have called Sarah Palin names, and, and so it's happened in that regard, and it, it's gone on for a couple of days. But, you know, we have millions of people out of jobs in this country, as everybody knows. We have a public education system that's, you know, got great, great challenges across this great nation. And we have our civic, um, civic uh, duties as a nation to try to provide information that allows people to make decisions. And now I think that most of what you're hearing is what's coming through those political um, ads that are paid for by PACs. And I think the journalists are being forced in a lot of ways to cover the horse race much more than the issues. So no, I can't tell really where anybody stands on issues these days. I wish I could as a voter and as a person sitting on the sidelines. Adam, you've also had the similar experiences as Cindy, but now you still have them. You were uh, chief political correspondent for the New York Times, your LA bureau chief. What, what are these barriers between getting the story that you think the voters should hear about, kind of the civic uh, issue oriented uh, kinds of political stories versus the horse race or even what the candidates seem to be uh, trying to get the media to write. What to, a lot of journalism students here who someday may be in the uh, bind of trying to write the story that their editors want versus the story that people want to read. What's, what's the challenge there? Um, a couple of thoughts. When I began every campaign, my goal at the end of the campaign was that voters, readers would know enough about the presidential candidates to make an informed decision about the campaign. So with presidential campaigns, that, mean, that meant everything, everything having to do with their, their biography, what they stood for. You know, if you had read my stuff, or better yet, my newspaper stuff, I don't want you to be surprised by anything Barack Obama's done or how he's developed. You know, within reason, obviously, people change. Um, that's the first thing. So that's always my goal. I always push for issues and avoided horse race coverage because I think horse race coverage is the easiest thing to do and the most facile and the most least helpful to um, voters. I think it's gotten worse and worse because there's so much competition out there, but it is what it is. Um, and then as a campaign reporter, going to your other question, um, another candidate reporter, Every day would start off, this is more than a traditional news cycle, and the campaign would wake up in the morning and they would have an idea of what they would want the story of the day to be. And I would sort of sit there and think, well, what do I think the story of the day is? I'm not being obnoxious or counterintuitive, but just like try to capture something about what the candidate is doing or what the candidate is saying that will help you as a reader understand what is going on. All with the overall goal that I was talking about to make sure people are as educated as possible. Um, I think there's been some bad coverage this year, but I think there's been some good coverage. Um, a lot of the stuff has reflected what the candidates have said. You have seen a lot of stuff reflected by, over the past couple of days, by what Santorum has said, particularly on social issues, which I do think is very relevant because I do think it gives you an idea of what matters to him and what he'd be like as president. I think the attention being paid to um, Romney on his weirdo mistakes, I hate to say this, but his weirdo mistakes that my wife drives two Cadillacs and all that stuff, I think that's legitimate and, and, um, and insightful as well. The, the, um, the uh, Rush Limbaugh thing was a little bit of a sideshow. I think it went on a little bit too long, but it did reflect this sort of larger thing that was going on, this sort of debate over contraception, which I also think is quite relevant to the campaign. We'll probably have a lot of impact on it um, as it goes on. I think damaging to Republicans, so. So, um, Tom, your title is Editor-at-Large at Neon Tommy. The California primary is headed your way. You've heard what Cindy and Adam have said. Are you ready to resign your position because it's an impossible challenge, or do you have plans for the primary? Resign the position and, and work for the for the candidates? Or? <laughs> well, that's another way to Starbucks. approach it. Yeah. yeah, there are a lot yeah, of people with careers that though. start in journalism and end up in PR, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, something that pays. Yes. Um, I don't know. You've given me a lot to think about. Uh, I, I mean, like. I think with the horse race element of it, some of it is just inevitable given how long this primary has gone on. And like I mentioned earlier, how many different candidates have been, have been put in the lead. And, and we have so many debates 
you know, this time around. I don't know if it was a record, but it sure felt like it was a, a lot more. And, and with each debate, the way that commentary goes is it distills each, each one down to, in essence, who messed up at one point. And that just feeds right into this horse race mentality. I mean, no one really leaves, you know, no one really left the, the Rick Perry debate where he said oops, thinking like, man, I bet he really did want to cut the Department of Energy. Um, people boil it down to like, this guy's not ready. And, and that was how everything was taken. So it, it's very difficult. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know how, how much of a problem all of the, the horse race coverage is, just if you're able to analyze it in a way that explains what is going on on a larger level. You know, like with the, with the contraception debate, uh, it was such a big controversy because it got so much, I believe, because it got so much online push and there was such an uproar over Twitter. And you can say, well, you know, this is maybe a sideshow. And yet, if you looked earlier at what happened with the Susan Komen Foundation and when they decided to drop um, uh, funding for Planned Parenthood, there was a huge uproar online and eventually they were able to change their course. So if, if the analysis that covers something like maybe a sideshow or, or something more like a horse race can delve into a core issue that people want to talk about, uh, then I think there is some merit to it. And, you know, obviously looking at the issues that the candidates really believe in and, you know, I remember there was a time where Mitt Romney would talk in every debate about his 47-page economic plan that he was releasing on Kindle. Uh, I don't know anyone that can really mention any of the, the tenets in it. Specifically, although I'm sure he, he has them, uh, then those things deserve coverage too. So it's, it's difficult based on the way that campaigns are run right now, but all you can do is hopefully uh, cover it as best you can. Just one quick, I think the contraception thing is, is important and significant because it gives you an idea of what, if Santar becomes president, what he'll be thinking about in making Supreme Court appointments, what will be important to him in making budget decisions. Um, the fact that um, Romney, I think, was on both sides of that issue, I think. I don't, I'm, don't mean to smear the guy. But, um, um, that reminds me of an old joke. Anyway, um, I mean, I think that gives you, that's sort of revealing. And that to me is not horse race coverage. That's like, gives you an idea of who these guys are. And I think those are big deal issues. Throw well, up Tom's uh, story that he filed at 1.30 this morning so that uh, <laughs> there you go. see it. So you know he was working hard. Right. Well, actually, the contraception debate and the move by the Obama administration, which sort of touched off the issue, uh, the health care ruling on to what degree religious freedom was going to be respected in the uh, rules that were implemented or proposed to be implemented for the Affordable Care Act is another aspect of this civic ethos question that we suggested would be the subject of this year's debate. We thought it would be around, we being my co-author and I, thought it would be around economic issues as it tends to be articulated between the two parties. But in point of fact, we've had a debate about the reach of government uh, in some very explicit uh, personal ways in the course of the last two weeks. So I'd Starting love to talk about that for a minute, sure, if I could. It. So um, I was thinking about, I always think being on the sidelines, what's the story I would write about this story that we're talking about Now that right you have now. time to think about it. And I was just wondering how many people in this audience know the name David Plouffe? Plouffe? How many people in the audience know the name D David Axelrod? And then how many people in the audience, audience know the name Stuart Stu Stevens? So how many people have read a story? I know you do, because you and I both do. But how many people have read a story, and I don't, it may exist, about the fact that when a campaign starts, that these consultants that work for both sides, by the way, so this isn't against one side or the other. Be, I want to be clear about this. Um, that these candidates, uh, these consultants are paid to figure out strategy for these candidates. And so when a candidate's got a problem with a particular um, category of voter, women, for example, um, and they have to figure a way to get those women, and a lot of these are swing Midwest women that live in states like Ohio and Pennsylvania and the swing states, they spend a lot of time figuring out how to get those women back in the fold before it's too late. And so a lot of what I've been thinking about about that issue is how much discussion went on behind the scenes with Axelrod and those guys figuring out how to get those Midwest swing women back in their camp, because they had lost them. I think I can mm -hmm. say that that's been reported just about everywhere, that they had been in deep trouble with women. And so now we fast forward three weeks after the entire country has been subjected. The Catholic Church is in an uproar. Cardinal Dolan is beside himself in New York. 
speaking out all the time as the chair of the Catholic Conference of Bishops. My 93-year-old mother, who loves Obama now, is having second thoughts because she's a church-going Catholic and is very upset about this. And I just find myself coming back to the thought that here's the American people trapped in the middle of this discussion, however pertinent it is, and Adam's right, it's, it gives us the information we need to shape opinions and make decisions, but really what was the genesis of raising this during an election year when jobs are a number one issue, when the public school system is in tatters in this country, and believe me, the other side's doing the same thing, but are we as journalists and are we in a profession reporting enough about this while the American people are caught in the middle of all of this? And I just thought that would be something for you to think about as you grow and your generation grows, that there's a whole mechanism involved in this kind of strategy that's important not to forget about. And it's so, a good so story. And it's a great now. story. So now you have some advice. Um, uh, I want to come back, uh, Cindy, to your earlier point about uh, the super PACs. Uh, Jeff mentioned at the beginning that there have been some unique aspects of this campaign we'll delve into briefly and then open it up for questions. Uh, clearly, super PAC money is one of the reasons all the candidates on the Republican side are still standing, with the exception of Paul. Uh, he's not dependent upon that for an advertising, uh, feed the advertising aspect of a campaign. But you said earlier that, you know, as a result of the super PACs, we have all of this muddying kind of commercials, not delivered by the candidate, but on behalf of the candidate. I don't think any of them, I could be wrong, because I'm not in the states that are being not yet. inundated with them <laughs> they're yet. Coming right. to a, coming they're coming to a TV near right. you, really. Soon. I don't think any of them took on the contraception debate as such. But is, wouldn't, if you were following the Supreme Court's r logic that um, money is speech, wouldn't the increased amount of money being spent mean that you actually have had witnessed this in this campaign a unique and you mentioned uh, unprecedented amount of speech? Shouldn't that leave no, us to a, more clarity a, rather than less clarity? Uh, it, I mean, this is a great question. I, I am so, um, just on a personal note, um, watching this in complete confusion, frankly. Um, uh, just to give another number, because as you say, this could stretch out as far as California. In 2010, again involved in my um, work with the FCC, um, more than $100 million was spent in each of eight television markets. And that was to take the, the House and Senate back, an attempt and successful in the House, as we all know now, the U.S. House. Um, in L.A. alone, $337 million was spent on television advertising in this state. Um, can, are, these, uh, are these super PACs getting a message through that's legitimate? Are they getting a message through that's important to the voter? Um, you know, I, I can't say that with any great conviction. I don't know the answer to that because they're clear advocacy groups. They're formed with the idea of getting their own message out. We, we actually have another phenomena in this election that's extraordinary where we sort of have these self-styled rich guy campaign managers like Shell Nadelson out of Las Vegas with Gingrich, and they're deciding <laughs> that they want to be a campaign manager and spend all this money and have a voice in this election. I'm not clear, Morley. I don't know. I'd love to hear from Adam on this and you and others um, whether these are issue-based PACs they seem much more to be advocacy-based PACs um, that are representing these candidates of their choice. And mostly they're, intent on tearing the other guy down. Maybe. Yeah, and wedge, attack. wedge type of issues. Yeah, I think they're, attack, they're all attack yeah. PACs. I mean I, don't, I mean, I guess we could define it as freedom of speech. I, you know, I don't totally get that Supreme Court decision. But all, I mean, yeah. vast majority of these ads are tearing other people down. I don't mm. think they really inform voters that much. I think they've distorted the uh, whole process because you do have, like guys like Gingrich, and even Santorum are still in the race because they, Gingrich is a better example. Gingrich should have been gone months ago. I mean, I'm not sure he should have won at all, but he should have been gone months ago. So he's got this guy, Sheldon Ann Adelson from Las Vegas, who has who just now made $30 million. I mean, just, and again now. And he can afford to spend $10 million to keep Gingrich in, in, um, in the campaign. And it distorts the whole process. And, you know, I wonder now whether the Supreme Court and Republicans, 
are going to look back at this and go, this is not good for the process because these are just these guys who are keeping these guys in the race when they don't need to be in the race anymore and giving it a really, mm -hmm. really negative tinge. Um, these ads are overwhelming what the candidates are doing and it's, um, I assume it's going to keep going through the general election. So yeah, I mean, I just can't imagine what I was thinking this morning as I was driving in. What on earth must John Roberts think of this? I, <laughs> you know, both the money and the and, and, and it's incredible what they must think. And the kinds of things that the super PACs are saying or adding to the debate are really stupid. I mean, I have no other word for describing an ad that shows, you know, a section of Mitt Romney saying, Je m'appelle Mitt Romney. And then, you know, over it says, Mitt Romney is French. I mean, and this came from one of his super They're all negative. They're all yeah, but it's, it adds nothing to the, the course of the discussion. It just sort of throws in various key points that might appeal to voters on an emotional level, but has nothing to do with. And their ads, the opponents wouldn't run, like that one, the, an opponent would probably not run an ad like that because yeah. there'd be so much kind of backlash. So, so but, but. It's like the id of the campaign. But Tom, you're, you characterize the ads as stupid, which means you may have seen some of them. Um, your publication is online. Clearly online is the preferred distribution platform for your audience, which I assume skews towards millennials. Uh, I hope so. Um, do you get feedback from your audience that says, tell us more, don't, you know, don't, don't send us clips that, with, the, with the ads embedded in them, we don't need that. Uh, do you get any pushback in terms of coverage or do people rely on you to, so they can ignore that stuff? How does the online world work? We get a lot of pushback when we don't talk enough about Ron Paul. Ah, that's <laughs> that, that, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, that, that's when the comment sections really explode. Right, right. Uh, we do too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it just, there's never enough to say about him. Right. Uh, it's, I mean, I think what's interesting about them being pushed online is that they're not regional anymore. I mean, you know, you, you, put, it, you put in an ad, even though this is a state that they're trying to win with these kinds of ads, they suddenly become national. and the story ends up defining a lot more about the race at large rather than an individual, an individual thing. Um, you know, I, we don't have as much media police as we probably should in terms of, you know, s curbing the amount of discussion about, like I maybe poorly described, stupid ads. But um, I, I think it's, it, it makes me think a lot about how much control, you know, it, it's, it's sort of you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. If you, if you talk about them, even to criticize them, you're feeding into their game. Uh, if you can avoid it altogether, you're sort of ignoring, you're ignoring the narrative, and that's what a lot of other places are talking about. So it's, it's difficult. It's just made, it, it's, it's added another element of control into the narrative that's made it difficult to sort of talk about the kinds of things that maybe are more important to voters. I think, I think one role, I'm not sure about your site, but one role of newspapers, or whatever you call it now, these days, and it's always been true, is to fact check ads. And we do that really, really rigorously, which means that whatever the site is, whether it's the actual published paper or online, we, we go people who go through the ads, and they're called what, ad boxes or whatever, and you go through the script of the ad, you fact check stuff, you point out what's wrong, you point out dubious distinctions, and you point out the strategy behind the ad. I think that's really important for all of us to help people sort of sift through the stupid ads. Yeah. I mean, more like, the super yeah. one, and so. can I just punctuate what Adam's saying? Because I think it's really important that people realize that, that because we started it way back in Texas with a professor, Kathleen Hall Jamison, who at the time was at the University of Texas. She's now at the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania, and I actually was just on the phone with her a few minutes ago as she was relaying to me her new site. She has factcheck.org, but she also has flackcheck.org, which is um, basically uh, checking these third-party ads. But the other thing she's done that she informs me as the latest in the Annenberg Public Policy Center has done was they have started to urge voters to actually write emails to their local television station to tell them to take down those ads because by law they do not have to, the broadcasters do not have to run those ads. Now if there's a, a candidate ad, uh, you know, a Mitt Romney ad, a uh, paid for by the Romney campaign and so forth, the broadcaster has to take that ad. But these third party ads, these local television stations, including the ones in Los Angeles who are about to make another 400 million if it comes this way, they do not have to take those ads. So this flackcheck.org effort is urging Americans to write to their local television station and say, take down that ad. That it's wrong, they're deceptive, it's mischief, it's detrimental to the process and so forth. So 
um, so, another, just to punctuate what Adam sure. was saying about truth testing as And, and well. as much noise as there is online, I think, about these kinds of ads, there's also more fact checkers out there than there have ever yeah. been, yeah. and people to sort of lead the discussion about. The crowd fact checking, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so there's one other aspect of this campaign that I want to touch on before we open it up for the audience that is unique in a way, although this is certainly not the first time we've had presidential debates, and they've become a tradition now actually honored in the doing as opposed to the talking about doing it, uh, which is a great development. But I don't recall 20 uh, debates in a primary season that's really just getting started, although the debates seem to have lost the audience. Uh, Adam, the, why don't you begin the conversation on debates by just giving your thoughts about, you know, we've talked about print media trying to do fact check, obviously one of an online crowdsourcing fact check. One of the purposes of, the, of televised debates is theoretically that the moderators of the debate get to correct a candidate and or allow the opponent to correct what the, their opponent has said about them. Has that actually worked or has the debates just been puffed up by the different networks wanting to draw an audience? Well, um, first of all, I can't tell whether there's more debates this time than last time. There's a ton of them. I remember doing the Democratic debates last time, and like me and my um, colleague competitor at the Washington Post, Dan Balls, we still sent emails like joking about like another lead that the candidates clashed tonight on the war. So I felt like there was a gazillion of them then, but I think they're much more influential now. I think more people are watching them, um, partly for the reason that Tom was saying before, they because people seize on events in the event in the debate, including the OOP stuff, they have a lot of impact. Um, so I think they've been a really big deal this year. The other thing that's happened is. You've seen, um, in answer to your question, is you've seen the candidates, particularly Newt Gingrich, attack moderators slash questioners for a asking questions. Yeah. And when people like um, John King or George Stephanopoulos, he's not the greatest example because he was doing that on birth control stuff and that got a little weird, but try to raise questions. And I would argue legitimate questions, including, you know, King raised a question about the, um, the, uh, the uh, affair allegation that came up against Gingrich, and I think that was legitimate to raise. Gingrich went on the attack. So I think the journalists have tried to do it, but it's hard to do when you're on live television in a hall that's packed with supporters, with candidates who think that they have, um, that they have something to gain, which they probably do, in attacking the mainstream media, these sort of hosts. So at one point, um, I think, again, it was John King asked Ms. Mitt Romney some question, and I don't remember it now. It was a perfectly innocuous, fine question. And King said to Romney, um, you know, you're not really answering my question. And Romney was like, I don't have to answer that. You can ask whatever you want. I don't have to answer it. And I'm thinking, well, you know, actually, I think you do have to kind of answer a question in a debate. Otherwise, don't participate in the debate. So I think it's been, a, in answer to your question, I think it's been, a, uh, debates have been very influential. They've had some good effects and some bad effects. I think, for example, the oops thing was it absolutely like better that he did that during a debate than like in the, when he was president, right? That was very helpful um, and not surprising. Um, and I think it's been tough for the media guys this year to do them. So yeah, but Romney's I, exact words were, "You get to ask. Here's, here are the rules. You get to ask the questions you want to ask. I I get to answer what I want to answer." That was quite a dramatic yeah, statement. Yeah, and I don't buy that. I think, and I think the journalist has a right to push back and go, well, actually, I think that, I mean, the way I would have reframed it, I forget what he did at that point, was say, well, actually, I'm just trying to get some information to help voters make decisions here, and I'd like to know how you really feel about yep. whatever it was. Yep. Tom, any comments on the debate? I just thought at that point, it was, uh, it was John King, I think, well, that happened to. Yeah, and I think at that point, he probably should have been like, great, I don't need to be here then. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll go out to my car and get out of the parking lot sooner. On the other hand, a few weeks ago in the, in the conservative blogger forum that Jeff referenced earlier, uh, uh, Andrew Breitbart did actually attack George Stephanopoulos for sure. asking the Griswold uh, Supreme Court decision candidate uh, question on of Santorum with regard to contraception and alleged that the question was planted by the White House through George in order to start off the debate about contraception and religious freedom that hadn't even occurred yet. I mean the rule hadn't even been issued yet. So there's another way of thinking about the conspiracy between media and candidates. Cindy, any final comments on No, the I just cannot wait till the general election to see <laughs> cool cat Barack Obama against Mitt Romney on live television. I think it's going to be great. I think, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big sports person, you know, I go to the Super Bowl and the whole thing, but this is going to be great. And I mean, I really do think it's going to be terrific. To Adam's point, you always have to watch because Romney's going to come out and say the most preposterous thing and you sort of say, where did that come from? But nevertheless, they're really kind of 
kind of the same character when it comes to sort of that cool kind of calm approach and that smile when it's needed. And so I think the image of those two on stage is going to be something. And I, I can't wait. I always keep thinking that are we going to have one of those there you go again, Barack, mm -hmm. moments from Mitt Romney, too. Um, because this, this economy is just so unpredictable. And if we do go to that, that sort of end point where we're, the nation is still torn about who should be, whether Barack Obama should be hired for four more years, you know, we've got a really close race. Those debates are going to do a lot to frame that decision. And, and there may be that moment. We don't know. So, so anyway. And someday I'm, I'm one of thrilled. you will get to be the moderator of that debate. Yeah, okay, exactly. Tom, we got 15, 10, 15 minutes for questions from the audience. Students first, that, that's your forum first. So does somebody have a question you'd like to ask of any member of the panel that we can start the conversation with? Where in the back? I'm missing a hand. But it, oh, there it is. Okay, go uh, ahead. It was coming out of the guy's head. I couldn't see it. <laughs> uh, uh, so I guess, I guess it's really sort of more for Tom. Um, so, you know, we're talking about how uh, how important TV ads have become, and then on the other side, uh, or, you know, and, and then sort of how this horse race coverage has become really, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of like easy, right, to do a, for journalists. But then on the other side, Tom is sort of optimistic that um, that the internet, um, you know, that there's all these voices on the internet, and that people sort of seek out the issues, you know, Twitter and whatever. Um, but at the same time, I think one thing that's really interesting about the internet and is that it is not a privileged space the way a TV channel or a newspaper is. So, right, so like the Twitter people exist alongside a publication like Neon Tommy. Um, so I'm really interested to see what all of you think, but especially Tom, um, about how, how uh, media outlets and journalists uh, will be able to frame the debate in politics over the you know in the next in the next few years as we go forward, if at all, given the right. omnipresence of anybody who wants to be a commentator on online social media. Um, well, I think in um in two thousand four, uh, with Howard Dean was two thousand four, right? Um, yes. I remember that that he was the first candidate that I realized was running most of his operation through an online audience. Mm -hmm. That he was really strong in the blogs and. Uh, this is pre-Twitter and pre a lot of the things that we use as journalist sources now. But he had pre Facebook, if you can imagine. Go ahead. Yeah, we were around for that. Um, so, so, and and it was this really interesting campaign where he was running it all through that youth that youth market, and there was a lot of poo pooing. I remember from the mainstream media, the lamestream media, for um, saying that it was a very select audience, that this wasn't uh, reaching everybody. It was just this kind of young, plugged in. Group uh, and then you know flash forward till today, every candidate has a Twitter account that a lot of their news comes through. I, mean, I remember you know when when the Prop 8 ruling came out in San Francisco, um, we had to wait around to see how each of the candidates was going to respond to it. What was their official statement? It all came through Twitter. So uh, you know from that element, it is sort of democratized across the board just because it is free. I mean, it, it would be silly not to have uh, a social media presence as a as a politician. Uh, so from that from that side of things, I think it's it's just become this kind of great unwashed of. of so do you sort of fear the prospect of your being respected as an authority, as an online journalist, as opposed to somebody who is in a newspaper? Because I mean, you you know, you, like even on TV now, there are people like, all right, what are people saying on Twitter? It's like you know, you're devoting it's always awful. good time and space <laughs> that. Are not is not being filled, you know, that it's being filled by people who are not being paid by, by the network. Or yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, that that just comes to a whole issue of, you know, ed, ed, have the issue of, of an editorial and, and or having an edit, editorial department and and the publication that you're with. And there's a lot of great voices on Twitter of people working independently of that. But ultimately, you know, I still think the best fact checking is coming from the New York Times and big outlets, just because they have the resources to do it. And I think. More often than not, they feel it's their obligation with so much noise out there to make sure there is some voice that is that is checking these things. And it would be nice if those things did lead the discussion. But the reality is, it's uh, it's it's a new world out there. Any the, comments from the mainstream yeah, media here? That question is uh, it's, I mean, it's a book question. I mean, it's a great question. I'm thinking about it a lot. A couple of thoughts. Um, I think overall, the this been a great. This whole change has been terrific. Um, I I was initially skeptical of the dean stuff. 
he did lose, but I remember thinking like really quickly that Joe Trippi was pushing it, that it was brilliant. Like they really did see the future there. Mm -hmm. The same way David Pluff saw the future mm -hmm. in 2008. Mm -hmm. We'll see, you'll see the future this time. Here's the thing. Um, I use Twitter a lot. It's great as an information source. I'm not sure how good it is on an opinion source. We can argue about that. I'm going to make the case that there is an argument for meritocracy. I'm going to make the case that it is a good thing, and I'm just going to use the New York Times because I know, know it well, that, that Maureen Dowd or David Brooks have become columnists on the op-ed page after going through this rigorous sort of vetting process and very competitive process to get the voice that they have. And I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the sort of idea that maybe somebody who has a Twitter account or beforehand a blog would get the same kind of platform as they will, as they would. It's just the way it is. I think it makes, makes it that Maureen has to work that much harder or David has to work that much harder to break out. And they do. There's a reason why they're on that, on that page. So, but you, you have your finger on a really important, um, important fact here. And then the other thing to respond to what um, Tom said, I want to be neon Adam, is that okay? <laughs> um, is I do, one of the things I look at very, very important now, especially in a paper like the New York Times where we have the resources, at least for now, um, to do this stuff, is to help people sort through all this clutter, right? Like, I think what is really important for us is to sort of stand above it. I don't mean in a ivory tower, sorry, kind of way, but in a mm. get through all this sort of junk and help people understand what the facts are and help people understand what's really, really going on in a way that other news organiza other organizations can't do because they just don't have the resources to do it. So when I'm writing a story on a big political, social, cultural issue, I have lots of time to report it. I have lots of time to talk to lots of people. I have editors, and editors are actually good things, which became clearer as I became older. I didn't realize when I was younger. Um, <laughs> to help me understand, to make sure the story is fair, to make sure it's balanced, but ultimately to make sure that people like you, if you read it, get a balanced, nuanced approach, understanding of what's going on in key issues. So meritocracy is good, which is not in any way to put down um, Twitter or blogs, which I think are usually important, especially for news gathering, but I just think we need to figure out our balance at some point. Adam, I threw up your Twitter page so people can see. Okay, you know, I, up there. <laughs> I would just say I think that, first of all, um, I, I'm so envious of, of the millennials, as more like call, you know, has written so much about, because I think you have um, really an extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity in so many ways with this technology. I love Twitter. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, concerned that like every old person like me that, you know, inaccuracies go out too fast and thus sparking, you know, a, a, you know, a 114 characters that may be inaccurate. 114, right? 140. 140, excuse me, characters that may be inaccurate. But nevertheless, it's a great, it's a great tool, and I think Facebook, and, and it's wonderful, and, and I think everything's going to be okay. I'm not sort of one of these old journalists yeah, oh, my I God, do. I think I everything's going to be fine. You guys are going to be great at this, and it's going to be wonderful. However, I want to sober us all up to say that the American people, 76% of the American people are still getting their news from their local television station in Correct. this country. So if you go out into Omaha and Wichita, and, and which is, by the way, why all these ad buys are being made on local television stations, because they're as important in these communities as the fire department and the police department. So having said that, though, I think what happens in those newsrooms out there is they they do read Adam Nagorny every day in the New York Times, and they do read Dan Baltz every day in the Washington Post. Thank God he's still working every day. A great respected colleague of Adam's and mine for many, many years. And these are the, the seasoned reporters and journalists that know how to out Axelrod and Rove and Stu Stevens and all these guys on these things that I was talking about a little bit earlier. And these newsroom political directors at these local television stations know to put their hands on stories that Adam has written or Dan has written or somebody else and to find a way to follow up on them as well. So that I think that mechanism is still alive and well in this country as far as these newsrooms are, at least the television newsrooms are, and good local television stations. And they're still out there in this country despite what anybody tells you. I worked at one of the greatest there ever was in Dallas for many, many years, um, owned by the Belo Corporation. So. So um, media consumption habits have definitely changed, but they've, they've been altered. Um, it's growing. We're in the evolution, but we haven't settled anywhere near where it's going to be. And I'm optimistic about it rather than pessimistic about I'm, it. By the way. Also, I'm angry I'm optimistic too very quickly, but I, um, you know, there was a period when you'd have a handful of journalists, for better and for worse, Johnny Apple, Dan Balls, David Broder, 
like they would really, Adam. <laughs> yeah, they, hopefully. Well, they really would help set the debate, help people that people would read it, would influence things. And I just think I don't know if any of you are hopefully some of you are planning to be journalists on some form. I don't think that's going to be the case as much anymore. You, even like Maureen Dad doesn't have like the kind of influence she once had. I remember I was working with um, Mark Hopper, who's now at ABC and Time. ABC? Yeah. NBC. Uh, NBC. A no. At ABC, ABC and has his movie on Saturday night, right? I, yeah, and I worked with him. We, we were covering the Clinton campaign in '92, and he was like just a um, not an intro. He was off air, right? It's just really yep. loaded. But we became really good friends, and we would talk about like how right job, wrong generation, because we could see how things were changing. Like, you know, it wasn't only really, we didn't quite have the influence that Johnny would have once mm, had, or mm. but also like our expense accounts were cut down too. You know, yeah. but so and I think those were the days. Those were days. <laughs> But I do, so I do think the job is a little bit different wherever you guys are going. The world is changing. But I agree with Cindy. I think that I'm, you know, this is, it's all going to be fine. It's all yeah. going to be fine. So now that we have a panel that's joined the optimism of the millennial generation, let's hear from somebody who's not a member of the millennial for our last question, David Bloom. I'm particularly interested in that little, uh, that little fact when you started things out with that I can't believe wasn't followed up, which is only 5% of the voters uh, in Super Tuesday were under 30. And that's kind of a stunning number, given the size of the, the millennial generation, uh, how engaged they were in four years ago. What do you think, each of you, the implications are for the Republican Party? I mean, I think part of the reason for the apocalyptic language by these candidates, some of it's done every year, but I think particularly so, there was a great piece I think uh, Tomaski, Michael Tomaski wrote about, part of their concern is that they are edging toward uh, insignificance um, demographically. They're on the wrong side of the demographics. They're older, they're whiter, they're male, more male. Um, they being Republicans? They being Republicans, and that's part of why the language has been so escalated. What, what's your take on what it means that only 5% of those voters showed up for the GOP primary? I would add to that, too. I think that there's a couple of things. The Republican Party is... younger, too, by the way. Right. Yes. The Republican voter Party is going through what I think the Democratic Party went through in the 90s. I get my decades mixed up. Um, and I think that they're going to have to do some pretty big adjustments. I mean, I think that gay marriage is the perfect example, right? Um, I had a conversation, and I have to protect an off-the-record thing, but I had a conversation with a guy who was a candidate for president, Republican candidate for president, not anymore, and he's very much against gay marriage, but we went off the record over in his office, and he went off the record, and he said, you know, this is two years ago, he goes, look at the polls, he goes, people under 40, Republicans under 40, they don't care about gay marriage, right? And I think one of the problems with, that the Republicans are having with this, um, with this contest is that it's positioning them on the wrong side of issues like gay marriage, when it comes to generational change. Now, I think in the long run, the party will work this all out, whether it's the two competing scenarios that they'll you know, nominate Santorum and then come back and come back with your own Bill Clinton in four years, if you guys know what I mean by that. Um, but right now, I think the age thing is very, is very serious. It's a little bit different issue, but the Hispanic thing, um, Latino thing, sorry, I'm from New York, so I was getting screwed up, sorry, um, is also, because of immigration, is also really a big deal. And I think the Republican Party has very, very important demographic issues. Now, Ken Melman, when he was um, chairman of the Republican National Committee, head of the Bush campaign, and before he was gay, or before he was outwardly gay, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, used to warn about, he saw him and Karl Rove, right? They all saw a long time ago the issue um, with Latino voters in the Republican Party. Um, and I think they're now seeing it now with, with uh, younger voters in the Republican Party, and I think the gay issues are a big part of it. This is why we're Absolutely. Well, can you imagine now? Yeah. So, so is Carl Rove's email partner what he thinks of? Uh, you want me to? Cindy's going to have to have the last one. Oh, I sound like a name dropper. Um, I, you know, I look, I, you know, every party has their evolutionary period. Um, I, you know, I just, uh, you know, have to say that I think that the huge dynamic in this election is going to be the economy. And I, I wouldn't write the Republicans off quite yet because the market took a huge tumble yesterday. You know, we're bumping up against Greece going into default, which I don't think ultimately will happen and so forth. But, you know, I mean, it's a, it's, we all know, uh, and cliche, you know, overnight is a lifetime in politics. And we are nowhere near November. And so having said that, um, I think that Romney is going to have to do something really creative with that number two spot. Be it Governor Martinez from New Mexico, a Latino woman, I don't think it's going to happen. But I'm just, I'm just, I'm just throwing out a, a scenario by which they have got to think very creatively. Is it Marco Rubio? Is it 
um, to, to the Latino thing? Is it a young um, uh, a woman somewhere that I'm not thinking Sarah of? Palin. Yeah, <laughs> is it Sarah Palin comes back? I don't like so. But I, I mean, I do think that the, it's going to be very, very interesting to watch how they respond to that number two position if he becomes the candidate. What they're going to do to to address some of what you're talking about. I just have one last thing about the gay. It is astounding how this is still a discussion in this country, and how I remember Pat Buchanan. I'm sure you were with me at that convention. And that issue is so um, distasteful and alienating to the female voter. Women cannot stand when the Republican Party beats up on, the, on that whole issue and, and the gay community. It, women, it turns even Republican women that might cross over in Texas. And I, you know, I covered a lot of that because those are the ones that voted for Ann Richards many, many years ago. Um, they cannot stand that issue. They don't even want it talked about. You know, so I, I laugh when the Republicans keep bringing it back and bringing it back and alienating one of arguably the most important blocks of voters in this country, which are females, because we do ultimately, I think, still decide the vote in this country. Okay, okay, then, Tom, as a millennial, you get the last word. Okay. Uh, well, no, I'll skip the thing about, the, uh -huh. about the gay marriage. But um, I, I think that the Republican Party hopefully will not forget, I don't know, hopefully, but should not forget that it's not a lost vote. The, the young generation. If you look at Ron Paul's supporters, um, they're, they skew very young and they're very internet savvy. And I think just because Obama has that that air of being for you know this young, hip, cool group of people, I think that a lot of, especially the uh, the very tech savvy um, social media crowd, is uh, is very much into freedom. And uh, you know the Obama, the Justice Department has not exactly been the biggest supporters of you know internet freedom, and he's not hugely popular in a lot of that community. So I think that you're going to see more issues being made about freedom in terms of you know libertarian type freedom that appeals very, very strongly to young voters. And that's something that will resonate with a lot of young people. Well, I want to thank our, our terrific uh, guests who came out today for this. Adam uh, broke away and has a, a deadline this afternoon. And Morley did an amazing job uh, leading the conversation in Tom and Cindy. So, Join me in thanking you. Please, please, please. And we're looking forward to uh, every Wednesday. What, what do we have going on with the Bedrosian Center next week? Uh, oh, spring break is next week. And then from the uh, Unruh Institute, uh, you have a, a good... Special interest in politics. You can play Obama's clip. And tell them who your guests are. Jack Abramoff, Jack Abramoff and Bob Hertzberg. And now talk about sports and sporting yeah. events. That's worth yeah. watching. And then in a few weeks, we'll have Bob Schrum and Mary Louise Oates will be uh, uh, here for the conversation. So thanks all for coming. Thank you all very you. much. We'll see you next time.